Desert seasons aren't uncommon in our Christian walk, but they're never without hope. This is part two of what's now going to be a three-part series on how we can thrive in desert seasons with Jesus. I'm Sharon, and you're watching Heaven and Nature. We have video Bible studies and devotionals that interweave the God of the Bible and the natural world he created. This all started with a book I self-published in 2022 called Heaven and Nature Sing. This has 3,365 daily devotionals for outdoor and nature lovers, written by me and more than 20 others who work in the outdoor space or just love nature and outdoor adventure. I'm going to start today's video by reading the devotional for April 18th in this book. This is the third of three uh, based on Isaiah 35.1. I read the first two in last week's video, so you'll want to watch that one too if you haven't already. There'll be a link for that at the end. Isaiah 35.1 The wilderness and the dry land will be glad. The desert will rejoice and blossom like the rose. There's a difference between traveling through the desert and living there. When you're traveling through, you bring your supplies with you. You have a pack on your back. You carry your food and water. You plan ahead and know how much you'll need based on how long you'll be there. If your trek is long enough, you may even ship some supplies ahead of you. But sometimes the Lord brings us into a desert and we don't know his time frame. He even calls some people to live in the desert. Then we need a different mentality, a different gear list, even a different set of skills and knowledge. And as followers of Jesus, the most important is sometimes a different level of trust. In fact, you'll find this in the lives of mature believers. These desert seasons are what built the level of trust they have. Are you in the wilderness? If it's a season, don't be in a hurry to leave it before the Lord has used it to mature you in a new way. Ask him to produce fragrant flowers that will bless those around you. Ask him to produce the fruit he's after in you and through you in this season. If you live in the desert, learn the skills the Lord has for you to find and store water. Find nourishment in him, just like he does with the desert wildflowers. He'll give you what you need to thrive in your environment as you lean on him. He'll develop life in you, in the desert, so you can partner with him to further his kingdom. Traveling through the desert is going to be a shorter term deal than living in one. A day hike requires less forethought and care than a week-long camping trip there, but spending a year or more in a desert is a different story altogether. Then we have a metaphorical or a spiritual deserts in our lives, like going to a school or college where you don't have any Christian friends, or working in a job environment that's hostile to your values and beliefs or living in an area where there's no Bible-believing church. That's what we would call alive and full of people who love Jesus and live for his kingdom. These can be hard, dry places, but as we saw in the last video, there can be hidden life there too, flowers blooming and natural springs of water giving life. I thought we could look at a few stories in the Bible where people found themselves in a desert, either a literal one or a metaphorical one, We'll just take a brief look, but you can dig in more on your own. It'll make a great personal Bible study. Our first four are people in a literal desert, a geographic location. Moses' story is told mostly in Exodus, and then because he wrote Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy too, parts of his story are told there. He actually spent a lot of his life in the deserts. First, he grew up in Egypt, which is mostly desert except for the Nile River and near the sea. His first real desert experience was after running away from Pharaoh's palace. The Bible tells us he escaped to Midian, which is on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula in today's Middle East. This is a good example of a literal and spiritual desert because he didn't hear from God until 40 years later. Then if you know his story, he ended up leading over a million Hebrew slaves out of Egypt and back into this dry desert area, the wilderness of Sinai. While the journey itself wasn't that long, the Lord kept them in the desert for a couple years to give them his law and prepare them for the promised land. Unfortunately, Moses was forced to spend another 38 years in that wilderness desert when the Hebrews refused to trust God and enter that land. 
The Hebrews as a people spent all those years in the desert because of their disobedience and rebellion. But some of the Bible's most miraculous provisions took place during those years. Psalm 105 verse 40 and 41 say this, They asked, and he brought quail and satisfied them with bread from heaven. He opened a rock and water gushed out. It flowed like a stream in the desert. And Isaiah 48, 21 says this about their time there. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and water gushed out. God is not limited in his provision, even in the desert. The next person we'll look at is David, who God called a man after his own heart. He spent years in the wilderness running from King Saul. A lot of that was in the Judean desert area. One of the key verses from his time there is in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. It says, David was in a difficult position because the troops talked about stoning him, for they were all very bitter over the loss of their sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Other versions say David strengthened himself in the Lord. That's a very key skill to develop, the ability to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. When we're in dry places, no matter how long or for what reason, we can learn to strengthen ourselves in the Lord like David did. Finally, Jesus himself spent 40 days in the physical desert early in his ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell this story. Matthew 4 verse 1 says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Greek word aremos, translated wilderness, in all three Gospels also means a desolate waste or the desert. It was likely the remote Judean hills, that area I talked about in the last video. I think it's significant here that Jesus overcame every temptation the devil threw at him because of a few main things. He knew his identity. He knew his Father. He was led by the Holy Spirit and he knew the Word of God and how to apply it. Let's look at a few examples now of people who lived in metaphorical deserts, dry spiritual atmospheres. The first one is Daniel, and we'll include his three friends too. Their story is in the book of Daniel in the first few chapters. These guys were young at the time, probably teenagers, and from upper-class families in Judah. The interesting thing with Daniel's story is that they came from one spiritual desert, the kingdom of Judah, into an even greater spiritual desert, Babylon. Judah was under God's judgment because of centuries of disobedience and idol worship. But somehow these young men trusted in the Lord enough to obey him once they got to Babylon. Maybe it was a case of getting a reality check or getting really serious about God. We don't know. But we do know that they chose God even when they were surrounded by an anti-God culture. And the Lord gave them incredible favor. In Daniel chapter 1, we'll skip around a bit. It says, Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. God had granted Daniel favor and compassion from the chief official. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. No one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, so they began to serve in the king's court. Even though they had favor, they were all tested eventually. First it was the three, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, more commonly known by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were forced to bow to the king's idol or get thrown into a blazing furnace, they chose obedience to God. I love their response to the king. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. That's incredible. How had they been living so they could stand so firmly in faith and commitment to the Lord, even in this godless, spiritually dry land? According to one timeline I found online, they would have been living in Babylon for 19 years already by this time. We're not told in the Bible, but we can make some educated guesses. First, they didn't absorb themselves into the culture around them. Second, I'm guessing they had a pretty vibrant relationship with God through prayer, knowing the scriptures, and some form of worship. 
I don't know how you could make a stand like that and not have those things a major part of your life. Daniel had a similar experience several decades later. According to that same timeline, Daniel would have been about 80 by now. He had lived the vast majority of his life in this completely ungodly culture, yet the Lord continued to give him favor with every king he served under. The Bible does tell us something about Daniel that was a major factor in him thriving in this spiritual desert. He prayed three times a day, every day, even when it became against the law. That got him thrown into a pit full of hungry lions one night, but like his three friends, God supernaturally saved him from harm. Just a little sidebar here. These two stories don't mean that nothing will ever hurt us. In fact, Hebrews 11 reminds us that many who follow Jesus have been and will be persecuted. Jesus himself said that. Millions of Christians have lost their lives over the last 2,000 years for their faith, but in these cases, God did choose to deliver them, and he will again. The point is, these guys show us that we can have a vibrant personal relationship with the Lord even if we're living in a spiritual desert. Next, I want to mention Esther. By the time she was born, a little over a hundred years after Daniel and his friends were taken to Babylon, the whole area was ruled by the Persians. She's famous for rising from complete obscurity to becoming the queen of an empire that spread from India to Ethiopia. What's very special about Esther is her relationship with her godly cousin Mordecai. Her parents had died when she was young, she was wise enough to listen to his counsel. Then when she entered the king's harem, she was wise enough to listen to the counsel of the head guy there. God gave her favor, and she risked her own life to save the lives of her people, the Jews. The Bible doesn't tell us how she became such a solid, faithful woman, but it shows us how the Lord can use one person to save a nation, even in a spiritually dry, desolate place. Our relationship with God is absolutely key to thriving in desert seasons, whether short-term or lifelong. A friend of mine, Michelle, made this comment about last week's video that fits right in here. I want to quote her. She said, I've been through many desert seasons, and one thing I'll never forget the Lord told me was to not allow the enemy to use my pain and disappointment as a vehicle to drive me away from him. He was asking me to cling to him and trust him regardless of how things were going. He's proven himself to be trustworthy time and time again. Amen to that. Don't let your pain and disappointment drive you from God, but allow them to drive you to God. We're going to stop here and continue to uh, finish up with this theme of thriving in the desert in the next video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you would, please click the like button here and uh, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. They both help more people see this content. And here's a question for you for the comments below. How have you looked at desert seasons in your life? Have an awesome day, and I'll see you next time.